Morning all. Welcome back to the channel. If you haven't already, click the subscribe button for more videos like this. Um, I'm up in the borders today, sort of towards the east coast. Um, at this 14 tonner, the driver of the digger phoned me uh, on Friday afternoon um, with an SCR malfunction. Uh, I got him to go into the service menu and I think we established that it was a conversion efficiency fault, so I'll just double check. Go into the real time failure information. Oh, out the way. Dub set like. Um, yeah, so we've got the operator inducement code there, and then this is the code that has brought the first code on. Catalyst conversion efficiency low. So it's a similar fault to what we've had with that 160 high track dash seven. However, the difference with this, obviously it's a 140 dash five, not a dash seven. Um, so the dash fives have a Perkins engine in. Um, so we'll be using the Perkins software as opposed to the Doosan software that I was using last week. And I could see the parts per million of the uh, knock sensors can't see that with the Perkins software. Um, but we'll start with the basics, uh, check the AdBlue quality, check for any contamination. Um, when I've had this code in the past, I've found that the AdBlue injector isn't in great shape. So I'll take half that boxing ring off, up there, and pull the exhaust cover off, and then I can get the AdBlue injector. But first thing, like I say, check the blue quality. So we'll do that just now. Rad blue quality is good. Um, what I'm doing now is just having a look, see if there's any underlying error codes that have been logged. So this is the diagnostic code section, no logged codes. Um, and we can go to the logged event code, see if there's anything else. Um, because what I've seen happen before is the NH3 sensor can throw a fault code up. Um, and sometimes it can just as quickly disappear, but there is a fault with the NH3 sensor. The machine runs perfectly, or so you think, but um, what can happen is you start to use more and more add blue, um, and that's when it becomes a problem. And you can have a log code here for the NH3 sensor, but um, there's no log diagnostic codes or event codes. Um, we've just got the active events which is what we've just seen on the screen there earlier and um, so that's all okay so uh, what i'm going to do is i'll pull the injector out and uh, have a look at the hole and the sort of condition of the injector and see what we make of that so here's the injector um, and first impressions it doesn't look too bad i mean the tip's reasonably clean but this is like a, a cardboard sort of gasket that's sort of almost disintegrated and you can see around the edges there that white crystallized dad bluey sort of stuff um and even you know around it seems as though it's been damp at some point um and then inside the hole I'll show you Just a show i'm gonna show you you can see how they built there's a build up of urea there just in that top corner of the hole there corner of the hole yeah just have a look at that corner on that circle you know what i mean now you can see it there built up um so my suspicion is this had blue injector which i do have one on the van now what i can do now is go into my laptop and um there's a dosing accuracy test that you can do uh, which the pump will run for seven or eight minutes and then basically the pump will run for seven or eight minutes and it'll spray uh, a dosage of add blue um, and the idea is you collect that add blue in a cup and measure it and it should be between i think it's like 105 to 130 mil that's within acceptable range um but doing that, you can see the spray pattern of the AdBlue injector. And also as it's doing its build up, so it's building up pressure. And um, you can also see if the injector leaks at all while it's under pressure. Um, so that's what I'll be doing next. And, uh, and then we'll go from there. But I don't know, like I've found with 
I've had a faulty ad blue injector and I've ran that test and it's still dosed the correct amount of ad blue so I kind of rightly or wrongly I take that with a bit of a pinch of salt but I think just looking at that injector like I have a feeling it won't be too clever so I finished the injector test and the injector spray pattern it wasn't a mist really it kind of was a mist but when it sort of just before it finished injecting it kind of dribbled off um, I didn't get a video on this phone because I was holding that into there and I left my phone on the worktop in my van so you never got to see it but um, you can see though it has dosed sort of the correct amount or it's within acceptable range um, you can just see the state of it really not looking great and showed you that deposit there in the end of the uh, chamber there so what I'm going to do is uh, replace that and um, to try and burn any deposits out of the SCR I'll do a couple of burnouts just to get it nice and hot hopefully we'll burn out the uh, deposits and it'll run clean and efficiently again so that's what I'm going to do next add blue is in spec I didn't show you that I'll show you that just now if it's still there oh uh, yeah Uh, there. Can't properly see it. That blue's good though. So that's my next step then is, uh, I'm sure I've got an injector. I went into work on Saturday morning for an hour. I uh, got rid of all that waste oil from that shovel service. I've loaded up with a 210 service just in case I can get that on the way back down the road. Put a fresh drum of AdBlue in and I've stocked up with AdBlue filter, knock sensors. I already had that one, I didn't have that one. Um, this is my injector kit which I always carry. So, yeah, I'll get that changed out. So that's the uh, injector fitted. What I'll do next is warm the machine up and then uh, with the laptop I can then do a sort of, call it a desox. Um, there's an after treatment regeneration test. What's the other one called? I can't just remember. Will it tell me? No, I need to get connected. I'll tell you in a minute, I'll show you. So what I'm going to do next is this after treatment regeneration system test which is essentially a uh, fast desox, fast regen. On the 140s you don't have the regen button here, um, it can only be done by trained professionals so <laughs> you use a laptop to do it. Um, so to be able to get it into the fast desox there's test conditions, no active diagnostic codes, that doesn't include event codes. Um, coolant temperature must be above 60 degrees and the after treatment dosing state needs to be in death priming or normal dosing operation. So um, I just need to get the coolant temperature up to 60 degrees. So to do that, I'm just gonna pull the dipper arm in, hold it over a leaf and just Put a bit of load on the engine and that'll raise the coolant temperature. And then once we get it around 60 degrees, we'll, uh, we should be able to start the test. So I've got it up to the 60 degree threshold and a pop-up box comes on saying if you accept this then the engine will automatically rev up to 1800 rpm so i'll accept those conditions and now you can see auto scr conditioning so it's going to basically do a burnout now that'll hopefully burn out any urea deposits that i've built up in the scr it'll give the system a good flush out um, and uh, hopefully everything will be good 
Uh, I might do this a couple of times uh, just to make sure that everything's burnt out. Um, yeah, and then we'll go from there. This machine, if you remember, what was I doing? I was away down South Cumbria that day and I was probably doing a bit of grumbling about all these different phone calls that I'd had on the way down there. This is one of the phone calls that I had. The quick hitch uh, had stopped working, so when he flicked the quick hitch switch, it didn't seem to acknowledge that he'd touched the, the switch. Um, so I'm gonna just have a look at that because I know he managed to get, I think he tracked about a bit, and then the hitch started working, so he put his ditching bucket on, um, and this machine's been sort of cleaning out ditches in these big fields here. So I don't know if he's sort of tried using the quick hitch since that fault came on. Um, so I'm going to have a look at the quick hitch system as well once uh, once this test is finished. So that's the regeneration test complete, but we've still got the SCR malfunction. So what I'll do now is click finish there. Don't want to report file. Uh, then we'll go to system function test. So it'll run itself up again and uh, it'll make sure that everything's reading correctly and if we've fixed it then that code will disappear. Um, the problem with the conver conversion code is I can well imagine the code will disappear and it'll probably be about two or three days work before we know whether or not we've queued it so we'll get that set off. Uh, this one takes a bit longer it can be anywhere between 20 minutes and 45 minutes so while it's doing this one I'll uh, go and have some lunch in the van so while that machine's doing a region I've just been watching uh, YouTube <laughs> um, I've been watching uh, Ollie Bloggs he's been to Reseath College for a look around and that is where I did my three uh, apprenticeship course at Reseath College so it's actually been quite good watching back. Uh, there was a bit when he was in all the welding bays. I remember a Friday morning before he used to get uh, the train back. He used to do welding on a Friday morning um, in those welding bays. That's bring back a lot of memories. Um, a lot of the hydraulic testing kits and things that they've got, that's all sort of new. Um, I didn't recognise any of that, but uh, certainly the buildings and the sort of um, workshops uh, I recognise. So yeah, if you want to see where I went to college and sort of got me foot in the ladder at being a plant engineer. Uh, go and check out his videos, uh, the last two anyway, at uh, Reseed College Tour, I think the video is called. Well worth a look. Big sprayer working away over there. I wonder if he'll come into this field. Um, sounds like the engine's revved out now, so hopefully that's that after treatment test done and those cords are away. Have a look. Ooh. Yeah, after treatment function test success error codes disappeared um so i'll uh, i'll fire it into another burnout again just to get any more deposits burnt out of there and then uh, i'll have a look at this quick hitch switch problem right that's the second burnout done service test successful so we'll finish that um and we'll put this machine sort of back to work with the uh with the driver, uh, I think he's back from holiday tomorrow. So, um, yeah, we'll know. I would imagine we'll know by the end of the week whether or not that's cured. Um, like I say, Nox conversion, especially with the Perkins, it's it's bad to judge. But yeah, we'll go with that, right? Um, I'll have a look at this quick hitch fault once I've got all this lot tidied away. So, um, yeah, quick hitch is working okay today for me. Um, I'm sure when this machine was quite new, there was an issue with the wiring under the cab. Um, it was to do with the lower wiper, but I'm sure I'm sure there was a problem with the hitch as well at the same time, and there was a lot of mangled up wires that are repaired. So I'm going to check them. But um, what I can do through the vehicle dashboard here is just see that the EPOS behind the seat is seeing all the input so you can see here you've got the quick couple operating switch right hand so that's that button there when you've got the quick hitch enabled it switches it from the power up button or if you've got a hammer on or something it swaps it from the hammer button to the lock button to lock your hitch on um, and if I scroll down 
to the bottom page, you can see the quick coupler solenoid valve, which is this switch here when it's activated, and then the left hand switch, which is that one there. Um, so you flick the switch, press that button, curl your bucket in, and the hitch should open. So we'll just try that now, but I don't know if I'll be able to do it one handed because the whole idea of it is that it's a two handed operation. So just bear with us. Um, I'll try and put you, well, I'll tell you what, I'll do it. So, so I'll flick the switch down here. That puts that message on the dash, but I need to press because it's spring loaded it wants to return to that position the idea is that you flick it and hold it over and then press this button here this is what I'm going to do now once I press this button so you can see now that the EPOS knows that you've flicked that button so that is now on now if I press this button here we should see that light illuminate so I'll press that button There we go, and then curl the bucket in, you can see the hitch is moving. Now I can let go of all the buttons, and that hitch stays open. And you can see there that I've um, let go of the button. And then to lock the hitch on, go back a page to this one here, which is to lock the button on. The light comes on. And the hitch should, yeah, there we go, the hitch is shutting. So I know that there's not a problem with a dodgy button, although I suppose there potentially could be a dodgy button with these joysticks moving around. There is a chance that there's a broken wire, but um, my suspicion lies with me plumbing wiring under this floor plate. So I'm just gonna whip the belly plate off and double check everything's okay in there. So obviously I've had it all wrapped up with conduit and that, that's the repair that I did, those three wires there, I can't remember what had happened but um, anyway it resulted in me having to repair these three wires. Um, I've just done a continuity test across these joints, there's no resistance um, and there's continuity across them all. I can't remember if I'd, I'm sure I'm pretty sure those, there's something to do with the front wiper, it shorted out and it blew the fuse which is the same fuse for the quick hitch solenoid, there's something of that I want to say, um, but that's all perfectly fine so I'll wrap that back up, put it away um, and I'll just have a quick look over the wiring out the back of the seat there that comes down and under, um, just make sure that's okay from the switch itself. Well, everything down here looks okay. I've also, this seat was pumped right up and the weight of me, it didn't even move when I sat in the seat. Um, so I've let the seat down and sort of bounced up and down and grabbed this wiring down here and wobbled it, but it still works. Um, so a shot of pulling all the, I mean, it, it could be a, broken wire, it could be a solenoid overheating, um, could be out. So I'll put it back together and uh, unfortunately that one will uh, will let it develop. He knows what to do, if he's in a pinch and he needs to change the bucket, he knows what to do to get out of that situation until I can come and look at it while the fault's present because uh, there's no point trying to find a broken wire uh, if everything's working as it should be, so we'll wrap this one up and uh, we'll get back in the van. So, there we go, another ad blue fault scene too. I can see the comments now, just rip it out and uh, ad blue is nothing but problems and ad blue this and ad blue that. To be fair, I feel like in the last sort of two years, 18 months, I haven't had as many ad blue faults as what we sort of initially had when AdBlue sort of started coming on uh, the diggers when they changed from the dash threes to the dash fives and the sort of early dash fives obviously folk weren't used to putting AdBlue in the machines so we did have a lot of AdBlue problems then 
um, but there's certainly not even half the amount of ad bleed problems that we're getting now um, and I think a lot of that is just down to folk being more aware of how to use ad blue and how to store it and how to treat it um, I think that makes a big difference um, so we're just sort of seeing more component failures now as opposed to uh, sort of misuse so yeah there we go it's just been one of those few weeks of ad blue problems hasn't it anyway uh, it is 20 past two now I've a good two hour drive back through to Carlisle when I get back through to Carlisle I'm gonna get a couple of bits and pieces on the van for next week uh, not next week tomorrow um, I have a 225-7 to go and see um, some sort of report about the cab heating not working properly um, so I'll go and have a look at that and then on the way back through there's a 140 LCR dash 7 uh, that needs a key fob programming so I'll catch that on the way back nice quiet Monday just how I like them just how I like them right well uh, I'll catch back up with you when I get back through to Carlisle you never know something, something interesting might have happened Back of the yard. Um, oh, I give up. I don't know where it. The sensor that I'm after is uh, an exterior temperature sensor. I've had it before with a 140. And it took a lot of getting to the bottom of, but I got there. What would happen was you'd set the temperature in the cab to flat out hot, which is 32 degrees, and if you turned it down half a degree because it goes down in half a degree increment so if you set it to 31 and a half degrees then that's when the auto climate kicks in and it would just blow cold all day long there was no in between it would either be hot or cold and I found eventually uh, that you can read the outside air temperature and it was reading 50 degrees so the sensor was bad so if you think about it if you set your in-cab temperature to 31 and a half degrees then the machine thinks well it's 50 degrees outside I better cool the cab down so um, yeah that's what I'm after for this job tomorrow an exterior temperature sensor um, and all I've got is a new 55 and this 50, <coughs> 57W um, and on the parts list it shows it in that back corner next to the rear tail light but it isn't there i've had the belly plate off underneath it isn't there and then i've looked on a 57w-5 and it's in under this console here well there's one anyway same part number it must be like an in-cab temp sensor job it's not there either <sighs> disaster so I'm hoping it's the in-cab one because it's a different one on the dash 225-7s. Hmm. Unless there's another machine I can rub one off. Don't think so. I'm not really prepared very well for this job tomorrow. Hmm. I thought we had one on the shelf in the container, but we don't. Hmm. Yeah, going by the parts book, you've got three wires that come off here. And then I think it'll be on that mounting bolt there is where your exterior temp sensor should sit. Um, and I've checked all the wiring back that way under the belly plates. I can't see it. Can't see it. And it's not going to be in the engine bay because otherwise it won't read a correct temperature. Obviously, if the engine bay is 40 odd degrees, then that's not going to work, is it? <sighs> Damn it! Not down there, is it? No, I wouldn't have. I wouldn't imagine they'll put it next to the Brumman hydraulic oil pump. Uh, there's no such part number on that one, so I can't rub it off that. It has to be this bigger. Oh. Go back to my parts list and double check. 
that's it there that red thing number 71 doesn't look like much here's what it looks like in real life see it there look that's what it looks like in real life and it should be see you got your three wires coming off for your rear tail lamp looks like it goes well I presumed it went on that stump there like but God, I can't see it anyway. There's not even any more wiring for it. Oh, dear Lord. Hmm. Idiot. Hiding in plain sight. Can you see it now? Can you see it? Now you can't see it. Now you can see it. Goodness me. There it is. Right, I love you. Might need you tomorrow. Come with me. Disconnect that. Yoink. If anyone buys a DX57W and the cab heating doesn't work, it's because I've forgotten to put it back on. Oh, put that lid down. So yeah, that's one part of my shopping list. The other part is, where's my keys at for the van? Uh, I love that. Is a mixture mix mixer actuator should be in here. Come on, door. I need to turn the light on because I've got this camera on. Mixer actuator, both same part number two one eight. Yep, I'll have one of them too. Right, I think I'm loaded up for tomorrow now. Um, I can't think of what else I might need. So we'll leave it at that for today. Thanks for watching. I hope you've enjoyed the video. If you have, let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, click the subscribe button. I'm I'm close to 6,000 now, like. Uh, it'd be nice to get there before the end of February, although maybe today is it. Can't remember. But yeah, have a good evening. Plenty more to do this week, so keep an eye out for that.